as they say, the show must go on. Hello everyone, this is Mike Check 95 <coughs> Hello everyone, this is Mike Check 95 with another Mike Check Productions Mike Check Movie Review. And once again, I'm going solo on this uh, Spider-Man series. The film that we are covering, of course, is The Amazing Spider-Man. Before we get into the rest of the review, if you guys enjoy this content of this review and any other content that we put out onto the channel, like I always say, like, share, subscribe, join the madness. We have a new Discord channel set up so that you can get easier access to all the videos that are posted to the channel. You can also discuss and share your thoughts through that channel and everything. There's Each channel has its own specific category for each, uh, I guess, variety section that we have for this channel. That doesn't make any sense. Again, loose cannon train wreck. Stuff kind of stuff going on right now. That's kind of how my reviews go when I go by myself. But uh, that link is in the description box down below. And let us get on with the amazing Spider Man. Critics rate this film a 7.2 out of 10. Audience rate this film a 7.7 .7 out of 10. Which, quite frankly, when I looked these numbers up, I was actually kind of surprised how high the ratings for this film was because I. Based off of just opinions on social media, I haven't seen really that much, I guess, love towards these two films. The budget of this film, estimated, was about $230 million, and they earned it back in the box office $758 million. That is quite a bit. It's honestly about the same level as the original Maguire trilogy when it came to earnings and whatnot. During uh, breaks in between filming takes and everything, Andrew Garfield will go around New York playing basketball with kids while in costume. Garfield had studied spider movements and tried to incorporate them into his acting of this film, which I did see that now after reading this as I was paying attention throughout the film, and it actually intrigued me that he actually did study the movements of spiders. and. I honestly, I think it worked because it really looked like he was impersonating an actual spider when he would like climb around, jump, web sling, all that stuff. To be more flexible, Garfield had took up yoga and pilots or pilates. Correct me if I'm wrong in the comments or in the Discord chat. Uh, and yeah, it, obviously it worked because he was quite. The flexible fella. For the 24 minutes mark of this film, there is a uh, African American individual who hits him in the back with a skateboard. But in the next scene, he is uh, portrayed or accidentally replaced by a white dude. That is probably the biggest goof that I saw in this film, and I'm surprised I actually spotted it this time around. I was actually kind of looking for this one, and it. I, I wish they would have not taken two takes and actually keep the same actor and everything. That's that's a big, big goof, but it, it is what it is. The Rubik's Cube on the scene where Uncle Ben is talking to uh, Peter after he finds the suitcase. He, when he puts it back down for playing with it and it cuts back to Peter doing some more research, the Rubik's Cube is in a different spot than it was where uh, Uncle Ben had placed it, which... Could be easily explained as if Peter kind of grabbed it and like messed with it a little bit while kind of thinking and then placing it next to his monitor. But that was that was that's just an off-screen explanation as to why it is not on the side of the desk and next to the monitor on this scene here. Around the 55-minute mark, this is the one I actually didn't actually see. Uh, Spider-Man covers the thief's mouth, a car thief, with a webbing and disappears. The webbing around the, the uh, thief's mouth had disappeared in the next shot. This is the only goof that I actually didn't spot because at this point I was actually enjoying the film. There's nope. actually four things I didn't really like or kind of thought was meh about the film. I kind of felt like that the Peter Parker side of Andrew Garfield in this film was a bit uh, edgy or too edgy to be cool to be Peter Parker and whatnot. I know it's kind of like trying to follow how the current times were in 2012 of how, I guess, teenagers were and everything. But it, 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 
cur- like looking at it now, it seems a little over the top. It's a little edgy. It's a little unnecessary, but and goofy. But it is what it is. It's it's the that interpretation of what the film is trying to give, and it didn't really work too much for the Peter Parker side of things. There was a lot of googling the first half of the film. I get it. That's kind of part of the the uh, detective work and the research that Parker does and everything. But I kind of feel like that there was a lot in the beginning. It did die down there at the end, so this is not really too much of it. But I. It kind of felt like it took up a good portion of the film. But, I mean, it was kind of cool they tried something new here with that and whatnot, but it's Googling. Normally, I'm a fan of dark-themed movies and dark-themed comic book films, but it felt like this film, like every other film from 2008 to about 2016, was trying to replicate the success of The Dark Knight, and I felt like there were parts of the film that seemed a little too dark to be a Spider-Man movie. I know Spider-Man's not all like sun, sunshine, roses and daisies and happy go lucky bullshit, but it's just it, I felt like I was try I felt like I was watching another Dark Knight clone when it came to kind of like picking up the theme of the film and it was a little honestly it was kind of annoying and that's surprising for me to say that cuz again I like dark themed uh, films or comic book films but again it's kind of over the top kind of like the the edgy too cool uh, goofy Peter Parker um the lizard's plan to cure illnesses and make everyone perfect was a little basic and a little like what the fuck but I do kind of give it some slack because for his character and his backstory and how he's portrayed in the comics it's kind of the same thing because the lizard in the comics is kind of like a lesser villain and it's kind of a basic straightforward plot so if they were trying to go for that from the comics in this film they nailed it on the head but for like a big baddie in this film it's kind of like uh what the what the fuck but again that's not like a, a whole negative point that's like a, a half a half negative point now it's time to get into the pros and there's actually quite a bit in this film that i actually liked i actually really enjoyed that I still do, and I did back then, that they actually introduced and showed Peter's actual parents in this film and everything, instead of just going straight to the uh, the, the grandparents, the uncle, Ben, and Aunt May. I'm not 100% sure if there is a version of, I think it's Ultimate Spider-Man, that has Peter, uh, Peter's parents in this story and whatnot, and what they were trying to do. I could be wrong, but for this film, seeing it Saying, say like I've seen it for the first time, I actually liked it that they actually showed his parents on screen and showed that they were still in his life when he was a kid and something had happened to them. When it comes to certain like versions and like comic book and artwork interpretations of Spider-Man, I feel like Garfield's like body structure fits for some of those because there's been some like Spider-Man that I've seen over the years in like animated series and coloring books and comic books and whatnot that are lanky and skinny like Andrew Garfield's uh, Peter Parker Spider-Man and it actually looks good and he actually looks like he fits the outfit and fits the character. <sighs> the dialogue of this film is definitely so much better than the original trilogy. I, again, I'm not going to knock too hard on the original trilogy if we ignore all the bad stuff in Spider-Man 3. But the dialogue is a whole lot better, especially with like... Um, with Peter and his relationship with his uh, grandparents and then his relationship with Gwen Stacy and then his relationship with Dr. Connors like all of that like dialogue wise story building and everything it, it kind of gets a little frayed at the end with Connor and Parker but overall like the dialogue and the storytelling when it came to like interactions and like trying to tell like a really good compelling story was actually pretty solid and it held together again it kind of frayed at the ends with Connors, but it still actually was really, really good, I, I really feel like. Um, it definitely uh, showed some more nerdier sides as well. Like, again, like, edgy, cool Parker was a bit too much, but they did nail the, the nerdier, like, awkward uh, combination great in this film with Garfield, and I actually enjoyed it more. 
probably going to get a lot of flack of saying this. I enjoyed it a little bit more than McGuire's um, performance, which, of course, that's a big gap between 2002 and 2012. I feel like this one did a lot better job at portraying Parker as a nerd in the, uh, or not nerd, a smart kid in the, like, detective and the web shooting building and try to figure out what's going on and and whatnot. The soundtrack, again, for the fourth time in a row, the soundtrack in these films are always spot on. I will always say that when I think of Spider-Man, I think of the original Danny Elfman score for the opening uh, credits and whatnot, but the soundtrack in this film was also very good as well, and it actually helped build to the story and build to like the the... The happiness and the sorrow and the tragedy and the anger, it blended in very well. Like a nice layer of like um, icing on the cake. I don't know anyone else that would say that analogy. Someone agree with me. The introduction scene to his powers I felt was done a lot better than in the uh, original film and whatnot. Like the original film he kind of just like passed out and like curled up in a ball and just kind of... <laughs> Kind of follows the original like 90s Spider-Man animate the animated series, but I, I enjoyed this one a lot better because it actually shows him actually kind of freaking out more and trying to figure out what the hell's going on and why is he able to hear things that are so min minuscule and whatnot, but also why is he able to like sense things and everything that was actually cool and done very well. This was a negative in Spider-Man 3, but this is a pro in this film, Gwen Stacy. Gwen Stacy was portrayed fantastically well in this film. Emma Stone, to me, is the Gwen Stacy of Spider-Man. Because of that, she's like the perfect image of Gwen Stacy, just kind of like the original Aunt May is the perfect image of Aunt May. This was the first Spider-Man film live action that actually showed him build the web shooters. Th this was also the first time they used a first person uh, camera for s a Spider-Man franchise and showing him like web slinging and flying around and, and like he jumps and like sticks to like the, the window glass pane you see his reflections like looking back at, like, at himself and everything. I like that a lot. It was fantastic. It was great. I loved it in the theater i loved it seeing like when i first got a dvd and i loved it now i wanted to see more of the first person of like spider-man which is weird because i normally hate first person found footage type films but if it's like incorporated in a little bit like for this film it was great speaking about the characterization i didn't like how peter parker was portrayed for the most part but the spider-man part where he's goofy he's cocky he's arrogant that was nailed on the head like that was perfect Granted, it doesn't create the perfect mixing bowl, but if you're just there to see Spider-Man and not Parker, you, you've got the perfect kick right there. The high school fight scene going into the uh, final confrontation and whatnot was done very well, and I liked it and everything, and how the story building was with like the, the father, who was the crane uh, operator, who kind of came back to the film after uh, Spider-Man saved his son earlier in the movie and helped Spider-Man get to Oscorp and everything. Like, all of that blended together so well, and eventually uh, Gwen Stacy's father ended up turning around and helping Spider-Man because he found out who he was. It was all done so well, and, like, everything about the ending was great except for the villain's, like, plan. I think that's about it. That I can really think of that I'd liked or disliked. I didn't really write too much during this movie because I was actually watching it for the very first time in probably about several years. This film is actually really good. And again, it, it kind of take kind of surprised me how much I liked about this film versus how much I thought I would hate but ended up liking and how much that I didn't like that actually stuck. It has some hiccups. But it's good enough to know the hiccups are there, kind of point them out, but don't let that drag the film down for you to where you'll not enjoy it because this film is still great. I'm going to have to give this film a 8.3 out of 10. I'm saying an 8.3 because, again, not a perfect film, but great. Not quite amazing yet. But great. There you have it. We have started the Garfield 
movies, and now we're halfway through them. Uh, the next time you shall see me, hopefully my cohorts too, if they ever come back from wherever teleportation land they went to, we'll be covering, in the Spider-Man series, The Amazing Spider-Man 2. And that is going to be definitely a uh, taxi ride from hell, if I remember right. But there's still some good things about it. At least I hope. This is Mike Check 95. Setting up.